Welcome back to the introduction to philosophy. In the last lecture, we had an introduction to religion. Um, and in that lecture, I told you that in the next lecture, we were going to talk about arguments for the existence of God. And so in this lecture, that's what we're going to focus on mainly. But before we get to Aquinas and his um, arguments for the existence of God, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just kind of uh, uh, belief in general and even... Uh, introduce a couple of ideas really quickly from Aristotle because I think that what he gives to us is important in the beginning of what it means to search for um, uh, to search for the answer to the question of whether or not God exists. And so in Aristotle, in his writings, he, he called this the first philosophy. Uh, the first philosophy, he said, was theology in that the idea is that the if you can answer the question of the existence of God, uh, and then answer the question of what God might be like, um, then all of the other questions and all of the other answers are going to start falling into place. So imagine that you've, you've got, say, a clothes hanger, uh, and the main question, the one that holds everything in place, the one that holds everything to that rod, um, is the question of the existence of God. And if the answer to the question of the existence of God is, yes, there is one, then these answers begin to fall into place. Now, of course, answers lead to more questions. And so if the answer is, is there a God, then you've got to know if that God uh, is caring and loving. You have to know if that God is just. You have to know if that God is singular or plural. There's all kinds of questions then you have to ask about that particular God. Um, but if you have those kinds of answers, then you also have answers to questions like maybe there's purpose and meaning in life. Um, and so you can have a lot of these answers that stem off of this one question. Uh, and then also the other side of it is if there is no God, then according to Aristotle, other things start to fall in place as well. And so the question or the answer to the different questions about meaning in life, um, obviously you don't have to answer questions about what God's like because there isn't one. But all of these other answers start falling in place. And Aristotle said that's why this is the first philosophy. That's why theology is the first philosophy, and that is why the question of the existence of God is really, in a way, the first question. Now, I said that in one of my classes one time, and one of my students raised her hand and said, then why didn't we ask this question first, and why didn't we answer this question first? And I told her it was because we weren't really ready to start trying to have this discussion. First, we had to start thinking about philosophy, we had to start thinking about truth, we had to start thinking about wisdom, we had to start thinking about all of these things before we could really tackle this particular question, and certainly we wanted to experience some of the rules of logic uh, before we got into this as well. And so, um, Aristotle said it's that first question, it's the first philosophy, but he's also going to say that's not where we begin. That's not the thing that you start with. You have to start in other places, but this is the one on which all the other answers are going to hang. And so as we begin thinking about the question of the existence of God, one of the most important things for us to begin to think about is, um, uh, is, is belief itself and what exactly merits belief. Uh, or that, that is to say, what is it that, uh, as we're looking at something, why, why would something deserve to be believed in? Or why should we believe anything? Now, everybody's got beliefs in something. They believe either in God or not in God, or they're not sure. You know, maybe their belief is somewhere uh, not in the middle, but rather they, they just don't have a belief because they're not sure what the answer might be. But everybody's got a belief in a way. And the real question is not whether or not you have one. Everybody does. The real question is, what reasons do you have for believing what you believe? And that was one of the first questions that I talked about, or one of the first issues that I talked about in the beginning of the semester, uh, was that you need to have good reasons for believing what you believe. Just to believe is not adequate. You need to know why you believe it. Uh, and you need to understand your own ideas so that you know and you can talk to others about why you believe what you believe, in this case about uh, the existence of God or the non-existence of God. But even then, before you, uh, before you personally you know, decide, hey, this is my belief or this is not my belief, what is it that is a, a good belief? What, what, what kind of criteria are involved for understanding that, hey, I, I have good reasons for believing or good reasons for disbelieving? There's a couple of uh, words that I think we should think about before we jump into the arguments. And the first one is 
the word veracity. And the word veracity uh, just contains the idea that people are predisposed to tell the truth. And there's a saying that said, uh, even the greatest liar tells a thousand truths for every lie he tells. And I think that's really, really true. Nobody pulls up to the drive-thru at McDonald's and orders a cheeseburger, and then when they get to the window, um, you know, laughs at the person who hands them the cheeseburger and said, ha ha, I lied and you believed me. What I really wanted was a fish sandwich. They pull up there, they tell the truth. Now, even the greatest liar tells more truths than they do lies. And certainly, um, I know, and probably many of you do as well, uh, individuals who are great liars, but even they tell the truth more often than they lie. And that's veracity. People really do tend to speak the truth. And I think more importantly is the word credulity. And the word credulity just means that people have a tendency to believe what is told to them. Now, children have this in a very, very deep way in that they believe almost everything that's told to them. Certainly, we don't need to be like children and simply believe any and everything that's told to us. We need to have a kind of a filter, a way of understanding uh, and knowing when, when somebody might not be telling the whole truth. But um, we, we need to be careful, um, or we need to understand, rather, that most people really do tend to believe what is told to them as well. And so we have that element of credulity. There's also, uh, the, the third idea here is called skepticism. And in skepticism, um, this is when people tend to doubt or not believe things that are told to them. And so the extreme form of skepticism is this idea of not believing anything that's told of you, and that is being fully and completely skeptical. And so on one end, uh, one extreme end, we have credulity, where someone believes everything that's told to them, and on the other end, we have skepticism, where someone doubts everything that's told to them. And we have to really be careful uh, and try to track something kind of a, a narrow track in the middle so that we're not paralyzed. Um, either by doubt um, and so that we're not foolish enough simply to believe everything that's told to us. So somewhere in the middle is probably kind of that ground where we are doubtful. On the other hand, we are somewhat trustful that we do believe what people tell us. And so that probably somewhere in the middle is, is good grounds for, and then I believe these things because I have some doubt, I have some trust. But here in the middle is a good place to be. Um, it's important to think about this because when you start talking about belief, um, a lot of people, or some of the people at least that I know or that work in my field, um, they tend to begin to deny the fact that they do in fact have beliefs. And that really is just kind of silly. And I've seen uh, several individuals you know, deny having any type of belief and just saying, I don't, I don't have beliefs. I only just have the facts and I believe the facts. And if it requires any kind of, uh, of a, a track of belief or any type of belief whatsoever, I simply just don't draw any conclusions. Um, that's really not possible. Nobody does this. And only uh, persons who haven't really thought it through um, really think that that's the case. And here's what I mean. In our everyday life, we go around in our existence and we um, navigate this physical world with certain sets of beliefs that uh, we know don't necessarily have to be true but we believe that they're true and we base kind of our existence on the fact of that these things will continue to be true so let me give you an example uh, i'm sitting in a chair right now and when i came into the office and i sat down I did not test this chair um, before I sat in it. I simply had the belief that this chair would support my weight. I did no tests. Uh, everything that led me to the chair and I plopped down in it, and there wasn't any type of making sure that the chair might break or had been you know, toyed with in some way so that it would in fact break. Uh, I, I didn't do any tests. It was purely belief that the chair because I've sat in it before, would support me because it hasn't been that long ago. It hasn't been, you know, five or six hundred years so that the chair has deteriorated greatly and maybe it wouldn't support my weight any longer. Um, and I also had the belief that, you know, nobody, nobody, none of my coworkers or none of my family messed with, you know, my office chair. So 
it's a basic fundamental belief. I, I didn't have evidence that it was in fact true. It could have been not true. I didn't search for evidence that that was the case. I simply plopped down. And I have never seen a student walk into any of my classrooms and test their chair before they sat in it to make sure that it supported their weight. They just believed it and they plopped themselves down. Um, all of us, or at least as far as I'm, I'm going to assume, that all of us believe that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. I don't know of anybody who doesn't believe that, who's you know running around, you know perhaps in a panic, uh, that doesn't believe it. You can't prove the sun is going to rise tomorrow, but we all have that basic belief. We have the basic belief that the universal constants are going to remain basically the same. Uh, basically what that means is that gravity will function the way it's always functioned. Uh, electromagnetism is going to function the way it's always functioned. We can't prove it, but we believe it. And so there are varying degrees uh, of belief and when it comes to things like the chair versus gravity. It's much more likely that the chair is going to collapse than that gravity is going to change uh, its pull or, or you know lessen or uh, increase its pull and so yeah there are degrees of belief uh, as well but everybody's got beliefs everybody believes that in some things everybody uh, has a type of belief it's not that they have proven everything before they make a judgment call that's not the case and it can't really be the case it's not practical it's not scientific. We see people in the world of science that go in with a belief and they can't prove things. They just have a belief and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of times people will kind of fight against the idea that they have beliefs. In fact, I saw one scientist in a discussion one time um, and he it was during a Q&A, during the question and answer time, and uh, he Somebody asked him a question, basically, you know, what about this belief over here, and what do you believe about so-and-so? And he said, I don't have any beliefs. And his opponent looked at him and said, do you believe that? Do you believe that you don't have any beliefs? Because, you know, that's a belief. Um, and so everybody's got them. You know, some beliefs are better than others. The, the belief that the sun will rise tomorrow, is, that's a perfectly logical, sound belief. There's nothing wrong with that belief. Belief that the chair, you know, won't collapse, not as good, not as strong. Chairs have collapsed in the past, and eventually this one probably will as well. Um, but it's a pretty solid belief, too, that the chair won't collapse. So everybody's got them. There's degrees. It's important that we understand that. And the reason it's important is because as soon as you turn to something like uh, the existence of God and whether God exists or doesn't exist, lots of people are going to say, well, I just don't have any beliefs. Well, you do. I mean, there's a belief in there somewhere. So really the question is, um, why do you believe what you believe? The fact that you have a belief, because no one can prove whether God exists or doesn't exist, that's not something that we have at this time, and I don't anticipate having it any time in the future, but it's not something that we have. And so you, you have to believe or disbelieve, and really the question then becomes, why do you believe in God, or why do you disbelieve in God? The simple fact is, is that we have a belief. Uh, the question is why. Why believe in God, or why disbelieve in God? And that's really more where our minds should turn as we begin to ponder this type of, um, this type of uh, question. And so, then having said that, um, let's go straight into Aquinas and his five arguments. The first three will kind of overlap sometimes um, because they're using some of the same ideas, and so it's important that we understand them somewhat separately, but they're going to blend themselves together a little bit here uh, as well as we go through them. And you'll kind of see how and why as we start moving forward. But uh, Aquinas and his five arguments, um, the first of his five arguments is called the argument from change and it's also sometimes called the cosmological argument as well uh, and so as we go through this I'm going to be talking about his original arguments and then I'll also add in some new thoughts from today uh, and some new thoughts from science today as well and so this first one again is the argument from change also sometimes called the cosmological arguments Basically, what he's arguing here is that objects don't move themselves, but they have to be moved by another agent. And so if you're sitting in your parlor, because we all have one of those, right? But if you're sitting in your parlor and the cue ball on the table starts to move, then the idea here is that the cue ball didn't start moving itself. 
uh, it had to have had something, some agent that was behind it that moved that agent, right? And even the agent that moved the cue ball itself uh, was not something that, you know, it, the agent didn't cause itself to move, at least not originally. So let's say that the agent was me. I caused the cue ball to move. Well, I didn't start moving myself. My parents started that process, and their parents started that, and their parents started that. And the idea here is, is that um, there, that each agent that moves didn't cause itself to move, uh, and instead had to have had something that moved it. Now, the argument here is that with with Aquinas is that you can't go back into infinity with this. This agent moved this, and so I moved the cue ball, and then my parents moved me, and then their parents moved them, and their parents moved them, and their parents moved them, and their parents moved them. Aquinas here says that you can't go back ad infinitum. That is to say, you can't go back into infinity, and so there has to be what's called a first mover, or probably a better phrase, there is an unmoved mover. And so there has to be something, because the universe is in motion, and so there has to have been something that started everything in motion. So the universe is in motion. What caused the universe to go into motion? Well, there had to have been something that was unmoved, an unmoved mover that started all of this moving forward and moving into motion. Now, you could say, you know, what caused the universe to start moving? Well, it was another universe. And what caused that universe to start moving? Another universe. What caused that to start moving? Another universe. And you could definitely do that where you, know, you have these universes that are moving other universes in that kind of chain. But Aquinas' argument here is still going to be the same. He's going to claim that ultimately you can't go back into infinity with a bunch of universes moving each other. You've got to have something that was unmoved. You have to have an unmoved mover. It in and of itself was never moved by anything else. It just has always been and it caused movement in this case and all other things. And so that first one is called, um, <clears throat> uh, is uh, the argument from change or the cosmological argument. Now, the second one, and you can, he's going to use the same idea um, here, but it's going to be slightly different. And then number two and number three are the ones that really are going to play off of each other a lot. But in number two, this is called the argument from efficient causality. And this argument basically says that nothing can be the cause of itself, but uh, everything has to have been caused by something else. And so if we've got um, a cue ball, we'll just stick with that analogy, right? Something caused the cue ball to exist. Let's say it was me again. And so I'm a cue ball maker, and I caused the cue ball to exist. Now, what caused me? Well, my parents. What caused my parents? My parents parents, parents. What caused my parents? My parents, parents, parents. What caused my parents? Parents. Okay. And so you can go back all the way to what caused the universe. And then if you say it's another universe, what caused that? Another universe. What caused that? Another universe. What caused that? Another universe. What, aren't, what Aquinas is going to argue is that you've got to get back to an uncaused cause, a first cause or an uncaused cause, something that caused everything else to exist, but it itself was not caused. Otherwise, you would have that same ad infinitum, or that infinite regress, the infinite regress, right? Now, there was a mathematician, a German mathematician called Leibniz, and he asked the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And the idea here is that there has to be some self-explanatory being, a being that in and of itself the explanation for that being is itself, not another being, right? And so what was the explanation for the cue ball? Me. What was the explanation for me? My parents. What was the explanation for my parents, right? All the way back to the beginning of the universe. And what he's saying here is that there has to have been something that was never caused, that has always existed, and causes everything else. But in and of itself, it's an uncaused cause, right? So... Number one and number two, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about number two here. But number one and number two, number one is the first mover. Number two is the uncaused cause. And so one of the objections to the uncaused cause um, has been 
the idea of a universe that has always existed? What if it, what if it was the case that the universe itself is the uncaused cause, that it has always existed? Now, there was a theory um, <clears throat> a long time ago called a steady state universe, and the idea was that the universe has always been in its present condition and that it was never any other way. Now, with, um, with cosmology uh, and with our current science, we know that the universe has not always been this way. It is not existing in a steady state for all of time, right? Now, there is a lot of different kinds of evidence, and just, just briefly, so, so that you kind of know, one of the bits of evidence was found um, by some individuals who had a satellite dish, and they were pointing it out at the universe, and they were trying to they were looking for something else, but what they kept getting was kind of a background static noise. And so they went out and cleaned all the bird poop off of their satellite because they thought maybe the bird poop on the satellite was causing this kind of fuzzy, noisy vibration thingy. Uh, and so they cleaned all the bird poop off and they pointed it back out at the universe. And I can't remember what they were looking for, but it wasn't this. And they kept getting this background static noise. And they finally figured out that what they were hearing was what we now call background radiation glow. And basically what that means is that the universe exploded into existence. There was a massive explosion as the universe came into existence. And that like all explosions, there's a kind of a background radiation that causes a kind of humming or vibration all around it. And so you get the same thing. Say, for example, if you set up a nuclear weapon, you get that kind of background radiation that, you know, kind of fuzzes and everything goes... Uh, everything goes crazy, and so um, it affects kind of the air, and it affects the surroundings around it. And the bigger the explosion, the bigger the background radiation. Um, and so even small ones have it, but it's just so minuscule that you know it it doesn't really affect anything. So with nuclear weapons, there's a bigger uh, glow, a bigger background fuzzy noise sound. But with the universe, the explosion was so big that that noise, the background radiation, is still out there. It's still out there and we can still hear it. Uh, in this case, those fellows found it through their satellite. So with that, that's one of the evidences for the occurrence of the Big Bang. And so in fact, the universe has what is called a space-time beginning. That means that there was a time when our universe did not exist and there, and there was a time when what we call space, or the matter of the universe, also did not exist, and then it came into existence. And we'll talk more about what that means uh, when we get into number three, especially. But one of the theories here in number two, uh, beyond steady state, because now scientists have rejected that, and they say, no, there was a time when it didn't exist, and then it did exist. So, um, <clears throat> lost my place. Um, yeah, so after we get past steady state, uh, there was another idea that was put out that, that was the idea that maybe that the universe um, had been exploding out and then all the gravity because of the mass in the universe uh, would, like a rubber band, if you stretch it to a certain length, it's going to pull itself back together. So the theory here is, is that yes, the universe banged and then it exploded and expanded, but when it reached a certain limit, all of the mass in the universe uh, began pulling on itself, and it pulled itself back together. And as the universe contracted and came back together, it would slam into itself again. All that matter and energy would slam into itself again, and so you'd get this kind of bouncing effect. So that maybe the universe has always existed, but it's always existed in this explode... Um, retract, explode, retract, explode, retract, explode, retract. Maybe it's been doing that for an infinite amount of time. That was the theory. There's a couple of different problems with the theory. The first problem with the theory is that our universe has a finite, not an infinite, but a finite amount of energy. And so if the universe had been exploding out and contracting back for an infinite amount of time, all of the energy in the universe would have burned up and been used by now, right? And so to kind of put that into a frame maybe that you can comprehend because it's a tough one, um, all of the stars in our universe are eventually going to, to burn out, 
because uh, as as we see we see certain stars like wink out here and there, um, our sun will eventually run out of energy. It'll run out of things to I'm just going to say burn, and then it's going to go out, and so it's going to go dark. And eventually, hundreds of millions of billions of years from now, all of the energy in the universe is going to spend itself. And then we'll have nothing but a dark universe. And that's what's called the heat death. And so it will run out of energy. Now, that's one of the theories that's currently accepted in cosmology. If that's true, and if the universe has been exploding and contracting, exploding and contracting for an infinite amount of time, then the universe should have run out of energy by now, and we shouldn't be seeing glowing stars, because for an infinite amount of time it's been exploding, which costs energy and burning while it's going, while it's expanding, and so that's costing energy, and if it's been doing it for an infinite amount of time, and you've got a finite amount of energy, it would have burned itself out by now. Now, what that means is that, and again, I'm just trying to give you something you can kind of latch onto. It took me a while to grasp this particular concept. That's a tough one, okay? So, imagine that I had a ping pong ball, and I dropped it from, just say, 100 feet, an infinite amount of time ago. Would the ping pong ball still be bouncing if I had dropped it an infinite amount of time ago? No, it couldn't be, because what the ping pong ball is going to do is run out of energy. So if I dropped it infinity ago, it's going to be a stationary ball at this point, because it's going to run out of energy that propels it back off of the surface. and Eventually, the universe is going to peter out of energy, just like a ping pong ball. And if it had been happening for an infinite amount of time, just like the ping pong ball would now be sitting on the surface of the table, so our universe would also be out of energy by this point. That's one of the problems for that idea of the universe expanding, contracting. Uh, there is another one. The second problem, and this one's going to be really fast, is that what we see now is that the universe, uh, again, space-time beginning, exploded out, started expanding. What we should be seeing if the universe uh, did explode out and is eventually going to retract and explode back in, or uh, con contract back in on itself, what we should be seeing is that the universe is slowing down in its expansion because what you should have is in the beginning, boom, and it goes really fast, and then the further it goes out, the slower it gets. Just like if you take a hand grenade and throw it into you know into a hole. The moment that it explodes, all the matter around it is going to be going at its fastest pace. As it moves further from the ground zero, from the point of where the explosion took place, all that matter is going to slow down. The universe, rather than slowing down as it should, if what we were going to see was expand, contract, the universe, instead of slowing down in its expansion, is actually speeding up in its expansion. And that's the opposite of what we should be seeing if it was going to contract back in on itself. And so for those two reasons, um, most scientists are rejecting the idea of a universe that has been exploding in and out for all time. That's not, it's just not something that most of them are going to be believing at this point. All right, so that's basically number two. And I, I want to bring in number three here, and then number three and two will kind of overlap each other a little bit, like I said. Um, and, and it's important that they do in, in this aspect as we're looking at some of current physics, right? So uh, in number three, the argument for number three is called argument from possibility of necessity. Um, and the idea here is that it's not possible to both be and not be at the same time, and it's not possible for something to cause itself to exist, right? So you can't have something um, that causes itself, and you're not going to have something that um, that comes into being out of nothing, right? So the universe itself, uh, God, it's whatever itself, right? God itself, the universe itself. They can't both exist and not exist. They can't cause themselves to exist. And we understand the idea of that you can't have something that comes literally from nothing. Things don't simply pop into existence. Um, so the idea here is that with number three, uh, it's not possible both to, to be and not be at the same time. 
so then the universe itself couldn't both have existed and not existed at the same time. Neither could God. And so God either existed or didn't exist, but God didn't not exist um, and exist at the same time. Nor did God cause itself to exist. Uh, and God couldn't have come into being out of nothing. The universe couldn't have come into being out of nothing. There has to have been something that caused it. And so there is a famous philosophical saying that says, from nothing, nothing comes. So there has to have been something that started all of this. Um, and Aquinas, in, in one of his kind of famous phrases, one of those ways that he ends his arguments, he just says, that's what everybody calls God, right? So the unmoved mover and the first, uh, the uncaused cause, and now with the thing that, um, that, that can't both exist and not exist, the thing that has to have been the causation of all the other things, he says that's just what everybody calls God. And so in this case, what we're going to do now is kind of lay it out in more of a deductive format, right? And so, again, something I'm kind of adding here. To Aquinas. There's going to be two premises followed by a conclusion, right? So two kind of arguments then followed by the idea of, and therefore it must be this way. So premise number one, the universe began to exist. Premise number two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause, and then the conclusion is therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. Now why would it have a transcendent cause? But First of all, let me explain transcendent. The idea behind transcendent just is that it's something outside of, right? And so God, the thing that is being argued to have caused the universe here, is not something that's part of the universe. It's something that stands outside of and is beyond the universe. So it transcends. It stands outside of the universe. All right, so number one, the first premise is... Uh, well, let me, let me back up and, and just talk... For a brief second here about logical arguments again, right? If the premise is sound and premise one is true and if two is proven true, then you have to accept the conclusion. You can't deny the conclusion if the premise are correct. And so one time I was listening to a debate and one guy said, uh, I agree with all your premise, I just disagree with your conclusion. And the other fellow who was a professional logician, somebody who studies logic, um, he said, if you accept the premises, you have to accept the conclusion based on the way he had it laid out. And so in this particular case, um, premise one, the universe began to exist. And we've seen some evidence for the fact of that the universe did in fact begin to exist. So there's premise one. If the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. It's got a cause that stands outside of it. It wasn't the universe that did it to itself, and it didn't come into existence out of nothing, right? We'll talk about that again in just a second, right? If that's the case, if those two premises are true, then the universe has a transcendent cause, right? So if the universe began to exist, and we see that it, does, it did, had a space-time beginning, if it began to exist, then it had a transcendent cause. Something outside of itself caused it to exist. Therefore, the universe had a transcendent cause. And what Aquinas is going to say here is just that, well, that's just what everybody calls God. Now, here, in this case, I'm going to borrow from, um, from a, a professional philosopher slash theologian by the name of William Lane Craig. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, he is... Uh, a theist, and in fact, Craig is a Christian, and what he does is he, he uses this particular outline, that premise, premise, conclusion that I've given you, and then he added this to it, and I thought this was really important, so I wanted to add it to my class as well. Um, after you get the, the universe began to exist, if the universe began to exist as a transcendent cause, therefore the universe began, uh, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause, right, and the idea here is that that transcendent cause is in fact God. Um, <clears throat> Here's what Craig says, and this is really good. So by the, nature of this by the nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. Now I'm going to read this again, right? So by the nature of the case, that the cause must be uncaused, nothing caused it, right? It couldn't, that infinite chain of regress isn't going to be possible. It has to have been an uncaused cause, something back there that caused everything else that wasn't caused. So it has to be an uncaused cause, or it has to be uncaused. It has to be changeless, changeless in the sense of that it's not 
moved on and become and, and gone, right? So it's got to be changeless. It has to be the same uh, because it has to transcend space and time and space and time and the things that dwell in space and time do in fact change. And in this case, Craig is going to argue that that being stands outside of space and time and does not change according to the laws of space and time as we understand them. So that being is changeless, that being is timeless, and it is immaterial because we know that material physical objects, anything that has physical atoms, changes and deteriorates. And so in this case, he's, Craig is going to argue that that being must not have a physical form but rather it must be a non-material being which created the universe. And then this is really good too, right? So Craig says there's only two candidates in that case. There's abstract ideas. Now an abstract idea in this case can be something like a number and say the number infinity. Um, and the number infinity does not create. The number infinity can't cause anything. And in fact, no mathematical formula or no number can create. What math can do is it can measure, it can quantify, or I, I would even say it might even be able to describe in a way the universe, but it can't cause the universe. So if I have two apples uh, and I add two plus two and I get four, that's not going to put two more apples in my basket. Numbers don't cause, they don't create. They measure or they describe, but they can't cause, right? And so you have to have this non-physical, non-material being, and it can't be numbers. It's got to be something else that causes the universe because numbers can't do that. The only thing that's left is, um, is going to be a non-material mind, and in this case, Craig adds, that has a will. And that is really, really significant as well because if you look at the universe and you see the order, and this, that's going to be number five, but as you look at the great order that is within the universe, it seems like, at least according to Craig, that that being had a will, that it had a purpose. It wanted something in particular when it created the universe. What it wanted is a completely set of different arguments. But it seems like there was some type of purpose. There was some type of idea that went along with it. And so that being had a will. It wanted something when it created. Numbers don't have wills. They can't want something. They can't want more apples in the basket or fewer apples in the basket or more electrons or you know more protons. They can't want any of that stuff. And so Craig says it has to be a non-material mind with a will. Um, it's a really interesting argument. Uh, you can find William Lane Craig anywhere on YouTube and I would encourage you to watch the debates that he he did a tour around the world where he did a number of debates against a number of different atheists um, he's really brilliant a lot of the atheists that he faced were also brilliant and, and uh, eloquent and it's worth your time to watch I don't assign anything in the class because most of the debates are two plus hours uh, and I didn't feel like I could make that kind of assignment and then get some kind of criteria for grading that particular assignment. I just didn't know how I would do that. But it's worth your time to watch it. William Lane Craig does debate uh, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, who are two of the most famous uh, atheists um, on the planet. Richard Dawkins, I think, is probably the first, but you know those two are also pretty famous. He debates both of them, and both of those debates are worth your time. They're good, really, really good to listen to, but you do need to listen to the whole debate if you're going to listen to it. You know, don't go out and find a 10-minute clip of the debate on the side that you agree with and then feel like you've listened to the debate. You haven't. And so it's really, really important to listen to both sides and carefully and put your own beliefs and ideas aside for just a minute. Really try to hear what both sides are saying. Uh, and you'll find that it, it really is um, It's good. It's worth your time. Those two in particular are really good. There are others. But uh, if you want others, uh, you know, just shoot me an email, ask me, and I'll, I'll tell you some of the other good ones that are out there. But for my money, those are probably two of the best ones that, um, that have been done in the last, you know, 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and so, like I say, good ones. William Lane Craig, uh, he debates both Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens. Both of those debates are good. They're worth your time. All right, I wanted to add that piece there with... Um, Craig, because I think that's good. I think it's important for us to think about. But then going back to the idea 
um, that you can't get something out of nothing. And so, um, uh, I, I listen to a lot of different topics and a lot of different documentaries, um, and I, I find myself listening sometimes to the same people because somebody will spark my interest. They're really, really smart. They do some genius stuff, and so I kind of find myself listening to the same people, and then I'll find somebody new, and I'll listen to kind of what they've got. Um, and I was listening to a fellow one time, in this case an atheist, uh, an atheist scientist, and he was talking about the universal constants and how he had heard a Christian scientist one time who said that the universal constants don't necessarily uh, have to have always been in place and that since they don't have to have always been in place, that means miracles could have happened. And of course the atheist in that case, uh, he got pretty... Uh, animated and with you know was saying that silly you know the universal constants are there you know they're firm uh, and you know they they don't change and to think that they do change just so you can allow miracles is ridiculous um, uh, do the universal constants by the way uh, are uh, gravity entropy weak force strong force and electromagnetism now that's the ones that we have right now and what we call them right now there is an attempt to try to put all of them together into one big theory called the theory of everything. But those are the universal constants that we kind of have right now. And even if you don't know what they are, just so you can have an idea, I mean, everybody knows what gravity is. You've probably heard of electromagnetism. Entropy is the rate at which things you know, decay or break down or slow down or fall apart. I mean, that kind of thing. And then weak force and strong force have to do with how atoms behave. I'm going to leave it at that because I'm not a physicist and I can't go too much deeper than that. So back to the, the science, the Christian science person, a Christian scientist and then the atheist scientist. Uh, the Christian said that, you know, they don't always have to have been in place. Miracles can happen. And, and the atheist got upset and he said, that's ridiculous. And I sat there, I was like, well, I, I kind of agree with the atheist. I mean, these things, uh, the universal constants, they are there and they have to be there and they have to be constant. I mean, that's why we call them universal constants. And besides, if gravity doesn't behave the way it behaves, then we don't get a universe that forms up the way we have our current universe. And so if, if gravity constantly changes the way it affects these objects, then our universe would constantly be changing according to how gravity changes and entropy changes and electromagnetism changes. But what we see is a universe that's very consistent, it's very stable. Um, and, and it's, it's something that we can kind of come to expect and measure. We kind of know how the universe is going to behave with these particular constants. Um, so I think the atheist was right in that particular case. The problem is, is that I was listening to the same atheist in another documentary um, sometime later, and in that documentary, the atheist made the claim that the universe came into existence literally out of nothing. Now, if you think about it for just a moment, the way the universe currently works, we don't see things coming into existence out of nothing. Things don't pop out of nothing. They come from other physical objects that are within the universe. And so the, the, the problem here is that the atheist kind of seemed to want to have it both ways. He wanted that the universal constants were constant, but then he also wanted that somehow, well, things do just pop into existence out of nothing. And so the universe apparently popped into existence out of nothing, but if the universal constants are in fact constant, then that's impossible. That's nothing that we witness. We don't witness things popping into existence out of nothing today. Now, for those of you who are into... Uh, into some of the into some physics, um, <clears throat> and you know anything about like quantum physics or the idea that things are co constantly popping into? Uh, you you've seen the um, experiment with the slit, and they shot you know the particle through it, and then on the other side it was two particles, and you, you've seen those kinds of things. Um, even when it comes to those kinds of things the experiments that they're doing aren't literally nothing. And if you look at what the scientist was talking about when he said something came into being out of nothing, then if you ask, you know, how, what is it that caused it, or, you know, what's the situation, they'll start talking about a quantum vacuum. The problem with that is that a quantum vacuum is not nothing. You've got quantum particles in a quantum vacuum, 
You've also got the vacuum itself, which behaves according to rules of vacuums, because there are rules that govern vacuums. And so a quantum vacuum is not literally nothing. It's something, which means that you didn't get something from nothing. You'd have gotten something from, in that case, perhaps a quantum vacuum, but that's not nothing. And so as you're looking at this, um, these particular kinds of arguments, Aquinas arguments really do, um, for all of the for all the hundreds of years that have passed and all of the arguments and all the fights that have broken out uh, over the arguments that he's got, they, they do hold some common sense practicality uh, that, that goes along with what he's arguing for here. So in this case, again, we don't, we don't witness something from nothing. Uh, if you're going to claim that the universe you know, is the only thing that ever just popped into existence out of nothing, that's a pretty big claim. You're certainly going to have to have some evidence to back up that claim. You can't just say, well, it must have come from nothing because there was nothing and then there was something. You've got to have better evidence than that uh, to show that you know maybe the universe did come from nothing. And it can't be quantum vacuums because that's not nothing. All of those things. And so Aquinas' argument there, uh, it again, it holds some common sense practicality to it. And so that's kind of a blending of two and three, right? And so the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, and in that case, there has to you, you can't get something from nothing. And so there there has to have been something that is the cause of all things, and it itself was not caused. All right. So that was the third. The fourth one, then. This is called the argument from gradations of being. The idea here is that there has to be an ultimate or a greatest or the thing that, I'm just going to say, kind of sits on top of the pile. Um, and so remember when we did a discussion in William James and we were talking about the most, the most capable I'm sorry, we started with the least capable thing. We put a rock, and then we put something a little more capable than a rock was a plant, and then, you know, I think like frogs and fish, and, you know. And so we kind of had a tier of, of capability, uh, a tier of, in this case, a gradation. So things were being a bit grander, meaning a bit more powerful, a bit greater, greater in their power, greater, 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 greater. The idea here with argument number four is that there has to be something that is on top, that is the greatest of all things. And in Aquinas' um, arguments here, he just says, and that's the thing everybody calls God. It's the one that is has the greatest capacity, has the greatest abilities. It is the greatest of beings, and it's what everybody calls God. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's number four. Going on quickly now to number five. Um, this fifth one is called an argument from design, an argument from design, and it's probably one that is best known today because there is that intelligent design um, movement that is out there, now called the ID movement, intelligent design movement. So an argument from design, the idea here is that the universe is very, very finely tuned uh, not just to permit life, but even in the way it functions so that it is not utter and complete and total chaos. Because, think for a moment, when you have a random uh, explosion, you know, if you, it, well, not a random explosion, something causes the explosion, but if you take that hand grenade and you throw it into the ditch and it blows up, you don't get the dirt that flies away from the hand grenade falling into organized, finely tuned patterns. Instead, what you get is random chaos. It just flops out there and lands wherever the universal con <laughs> constants put it, really. But it's random. I mean, there's no real uh, purpose or meaning. There's no design, right? And so one of the most famous arguments for design comes from William Paley, uh, who was an author um, back when the grandfather clocks, the one with all the cogs and springs and wheels and stuff, were uh, popular and, and really kind of all that uh, existed. And so the idea here was that if you've got a clock, a perfectly functioning clock, and the grandfather clock that maybe was in your grandparents' house that you know kept you awake at night because it ticked back and forth, 
you wouldn't anticipate that nature itself created that. And so what Paley says is that if you're walking along the beach and you find this clock sitting on the beach, you, you would assume there was a clock maker. You would assume that because of the complexity and the fine-tuning required uh, in order for this thing to function, then you would assume there was a clock maker. You wouldn't assume that it was made by nature because things in nature don't move from chaos to order. They move from order to chaos. And so since the universe is very well ordered, then you don't expect that somehow the universe uh, came from came into order from disorder on its own, but it must have had a designer who caused it to be well ordered, right? Now, that's, that's the argument. The idea is that it's too well tuned. It's too well uh, set up to have just been random chance. Now, when you get into this idea of random chance, again, there are going to be individuals who just said, well, no, I mean, there's... Uh, there's that infinite number of universes out there, and we just happen to be in the one that is um, that that looks the way it does, that functions the way it does, that is uh, it appears to be finely tuned, um, but it's just the fact that there's an infinite number of universes, and so all possible universes exist, and therefore this universe also exists because it's one of the possible ones, and there so therefore it exists. It's a couple of different problems with that, and the first one is really, really simple. It's kind of the one I like to, to stick with, and then I'll point you to some of the others because uh, they're complicated. It's not something I want to do in an intro class, um, but it is out there. Um, one of the problems I have for this infinite number of universes is that we have no evidence for the that there is an infinite number of universes out there. We have no evidence that the infinite number of universes exist, we have no evidence that all possible universes exist either. We know of our universe, and we know very little about our universe, but we know that this one exists. Beyond that, we don't know. And so to just say, well, there's an infinite number and all possible universes exist, where's your evidence? You've got to show good reason for believing in an infinite number in all possible universes. And if you don't have that evidence, then, I mean, you're, you're simply saying that, you know, I like this, or I want this, or this is just what I believe because. We have no evidence for that particular, um, for that particular belief, and so certainly you need to try to find evidence if that's your particular belief. There are number problems with that particular thing as well. Uh, with that particular idea of an infinite number of all possible universes. Um, but again, I, I don't want to go into it. I'm, I'm going to point you back to Craig and just say he's got some really, really good um, stuff. What Craig tends to do is bring... Um, he, he tends to go out and find the best minds in those fields, and he finds their writings, and then he pulls them together, and he explains them in such a way that um, most people can grasp what he's doing. So if you're really into the idea of an infinite number of universes, you need to go take a look at, at some of what he does, because what he can do is introduce you to other individuals who have written about this as well. For example, um, he talks about a fellow by the name of Roger Penrose, um, who is uh, a mathematician who talks about how it isn't possible for this infinite number of universes to exist. And so... If that's something you're interested in, my advice is that you listen to Craig or you go find Roger Penrose and you look at uh, the idea of the multiverse hypothesis um, and versus the fine-tuning hypothesis. Um, it's just more complicated than I want to get into in a class like this. So, all right. Um, back quickly to this idea of the fine-tuning. The universe is certainly fine-tuned um, in the... In the argument here, what he's arguing for is that the universe really, really is finely tuned, uh, and not just the universe itself, not just the greater universe, but life on this planet is also finely tuned. And so if you look at something like, for example, DNA, uh, if, if you look at DNA, there's a tremendous amount of information that is encoded on a very small strand of DNA. And so basically the best way to try to describe this is that if you take the entire set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, what's that? Okay, The Encyclopedia Britannica, when I was a kid, was the best form of Google 
that we had. And my parents bought a set of Britannica, um, and I, I think there was like 28 or 32 volumes, and we're talking you know, really, really big, thick books that we had on our bookshelves. And the idea was is that everything that's in the world, uh, there was a paragraph or a page or two or ten, or you know, depended on how much information we gathered about that particular uh, thing, all the information that we could find and collect and put into books was there in this book. And so to have an entire set of the Encyclopedia Britannica meant that at any time I could go open the book and read about a person or a thing or a place or a, an event or any of those things. Today what I do, um, I'll be watching TV and somebody will say something. I don't know what that means. I'll pull out Google and I'll read a quick page about, you know, that thing. So it was the Google of the time. You know, what do we know about Antarctica? Pull off the A volume, you know, read Antarctica. Okay, so in this set of Encyclopedia Britannica, all the books, all 28 or 32 volumes, all that information that's in all of those books, all that information, the same size of information, is contained on a single strand of our DNA. All that information. And so let me try to kind of make you try to grasp here fine-tuning using this example. Imagine that we put the entire Encyclopedia Britannica into a computer program where the program could shuffle all the letters, not just the words, but the letters and all the periods and all the commas, all of everything. They could shuffle everything around just by hitting this button, right? So hitting the shuffle button. Every word, every letter, and every period, and every everything in there would shuffle and move around randomly for a second and then it would become stationary again, right? If you had a complete set in, in its you know, perfect working condition there on the shelf, you put it in the computer, you hit shuffle, and it disorganized into chaos, how many times or for how long would you have to push the shuffle button again until all of that information came back into order? and so that you would then have that perfect working set of the Encyclopedia Britannica again. How many times would you have to push the button? And the idea here is, is that you couldn't. I mean, you could push that button for eternity, and you'd never get the encyclopedia back into its perfect working, functioning form again, because there's just too much information. But you could put the encyclopedia back into working order if you had intelligent beings who came along and took the information and then ordered it back into some type of intelligent, perfect working order again. So the idea is that you have to have intelligence behind it in order to get the order. You don't get order out of chaos. You get chaos out of chaos. And if you put order into chaos, the ordered entity will move to chaos as well. That's the idea. Now, it works for really complicated things like DNA, all the information on your DNA. How did it get organized? You know, the argument here is that it couldn't have happened randomly over time, but rather instead uh, there has to have been intelligent being behind it that ordered the information on your DNA. And that's going to be true about everything in the universe, again, according to this argument. Um, those are really big examples, and I, I also like to use a really simple one. And so I knew a fellow who worked in his garage right beside his house and one morning as he walked from his house to his garage office he lined up 10 stones just you know stones he lined up 10 stones in a row in the middle of the sidewalk leading into the garage and his wife every morning you know after he'd been out there for say an hour or so she would bring him a cup of coffee and so he arranged those ten stones. An hour later, his wife comes out, brings him a cup of coffee, and she looked at him and she said, why did you put those stones you know, in a line on the sidewalk? And he did it in order to get this example so that, so that we would understand that even simple order, something as simple as putting ten stones in an order, is not something that nature does. We don't see nature ordering uh, things that way. Instead, uh, what we see is that nature causes disorder. It throws stones everywhere. They ran, land randomly, but they don't land in 
lines running straight down sidewalks and into garages. So yes, with DNA, that's a very large example. It's kind of mind-blowing, or at least it is for me. Uh, but even simple things like lining up stones, nature doesn't even do that. And so the idea here is, is that you have to have an intelligence, in that case him, he was the intelligence behind the lining up of the stones. And so the idea here, the argument is that the universe is very complicated and it must have had an intelligent designer that is behind it. And again, Aquinas would just say, and that's what everybody calls God. Now, um, kind of a final thing to ponder here. And th those are Aquinas's five arguments for the existence of God. I added to some of them. You know, I, I, I put in some more stuff, hopefully, for, that's a little more modern um, for us as well. But those are basically the arguments that Aquinas gives for us. But I wanted to add something kind of here at the end as well. Um, uh, and, and in this case, coming from Greek and uh, talking a little bit even about um, one of the passages from the New Testament, because I had to translate Greek when I was in college uh, and when I was working on my master's. And so the New Testament text is written mostly in Greek. And so I had to translate some of those passages as well and, and work with some of them. And one of the books that I had to translate was the book of 1 John and it's only five chapters, so it wasn't, it's not like trying to translate Romans, which is a monstrous uh, book. Um, but it, it wasn't really, really complicated Greek either. It's pretty simple. Um, and so we were working on that one. And one of the things that the professor pointed out uh, in those first verses of 1 John, and if you're Christian, you're probably familiar with the passage. The passage says, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. Now, in Greek, the word word, the word word is logos, logos. And that word can actually be translated um, not just as the word word, it can also be translated as the point of it all. Um, and so if you and another, uh, and somebody that you were suing, for example, in an ancient court in Greece, uh, and if you brought the court case before the judge, the opening statement might say the Logos, right? So it might say something like the point of all of this. The reason that we're here in the judgment court standing before you is that he stole my chickens, right? And so the point of all of this, the Logos of this is, right? And so there in First John, if you take that word Logos and you retranslate it instead of in the beginning was the word and instead you say something like in the beginning was the point of it all, and the point of it all was with God, and the point of it all was God. And it, it kind of goes back to what Leibniz was saying, uh, and to some of what Aristotle was talking about, in the, that we talked about there in the beginning as well. If there is a point to all of this, or if there is something out there that started all of this, if there is a point, if there's a logos to all of this, you know, maybe it's this God being. And so maybe First John got it right in saying, in the beginning was the point of it all, and the point of it all uh, was, in fact, God. Now, again, something to think about as you're pondering life and the meaning of life and whether or not God exists, and if God does exist, what kind of meaning do we have? And if God doesn't exist, what kind of meaning do we have? And so, again, uh, kind of the, uh, the point of it all. So those are... Uh, the five arguments from Aquinas talked a little bit about belief and, and what warrants good belief and then again hopefully just something to kind of think about at the end as well with um, the purpose or meaning of life, the purpose and meaning of the universe, if there is one. Uh, does it have anything to do with uh, God, with the deity? Um, there are more arguments and there are individuals out there who are certainly uh, very, very good at explaining a lot of the arguments uh, for God's existence. And if you want more information, this is one of the areas that I spend quite a bit of time in. So I, I've listened to multiple other people um, who make arguments for the existence of God and make arguments against the existence of God. If you want something like that, certainly uh, give me a, shoot me a quick email. Let me know. 
I'll give you a rundown. I'll recommend, you know, debates. That's kind of my favorite way to get information is to listen to both sides, you know, quickly and easily. And my favorite ones are always ones with question and answers because the audience, um, you know, we get to we get to try to chime in a little bit and have some input as well. So if you want something like that, shoot me an email. We'll get it. I'll, I'll get that to you for sure. Um, and then next time, uh, we're going to focus on the problem of evil. Uh, and in this case, then that functioning as one of the arguments against the existence of God. And so next time, the problem of evil.